treat this week. I, uh, I, oh, look at you bringing me a water. Thank you, baby sister. I love you. I love you back, baby sister. I, uh, I, I love studying the Word of God wherever it's at. And I, I find, as John likes to tell us, chocolate-covered cherries in the Bible. And it is, uh, it's fun, it's exciting. But um, this week, I got to just go study what was interesting to me. I've been wanting to look at the word desire through the Word of God. I, I've run across it different places, and it's piqued my interest but it was just too big of a topic to grab and uh, in, in the middle of everything else I was doing. Plus, when I'm, when I'm studying to preach, there's a certain stress um, to get it right, to spend time with it. So, man, I have been, I have been studying this this week, and I, can't, I don't know how many times I've been studying, and I push my keyboard aside, and I get down on my knees or on my face on my desk, and I start just, just doing business with God. It, it, this, this, this study has been has been so good for me, and it was a heart check for me. It was a, it was a why are you doing, what are you doing, and I'm just, I'm more in love with God this week than I've ever been in my life, and um, I want every week from now until I go to be with him, I want it to be like this week. I want it to be more. I want to be closer. I want to desire him more. I want to, to want what he wants in my life more, and uh, I can't. I ended up in tears so many times as I was studying this week, just just spending time with the Lord, and uh, and, and I, I just I enjoy him. Okay, that's that's enough of my of what I thought about it. Let me let me just tell you. Now the problem that I have is the topic's too big to fit in a study, and I'm I've worked and I've stressed over, I've prayed over, I've stayed up at night, I I have I've kind of been a bad husband uh, because I've been trying to figure out how how can I even begin to encapsulate the joy and and the 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 frustration and the and and the praise that I found in this and I, I don't know how to do it but I'm going to do my best so a word called desire is what we're going to study and I call this my heart check study because that's what it was to me we're going to start right here in Genesis 3 6 and this is one of those things where I found a signature by the Holy Spirit he finished writing and translating this book and he signed it, and here's part of his signature. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And when a woman saw, when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. The very first time in the scripture, the first time that the word desire is used, God has said, do not eat of this tree. The woman looked at the tree and recognized that she desired that to be wise. The very first sin that, that we see is her desire to have something that God told her not to have. Let's look at the very last time the word desire is used in the scripture. Romans 9, 6. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's the cost of sin. It's not that God punishes us. The natural cost of sin is death. The very first time the word desire is used is when a woman says, I reject God and I want this thing. I'm moving toward it. God says that thing will kill you. The last time that desire is used in the Bible, mankind agree with God. They say, God, this is the, the, the cost of our sin is too much and we desire to die. Isn't that incredible that the scripture has encompassed the cost of sin from the beginning of the first chapter or the first book of the Bible to the middle of the last book of the Bible encapsulated sin by the desire of mankind to seek something that God doesn't want, want them to have because it will cause them to die and it will cause them to, to f experience death. And he didn't want that for them. And, and there it is, first and last word of, in the scripture of desire. Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for its beauty and holiness. Thank you for how it changes us. Father, help us to be uh, gentle before you this morning, to be adjusted by you, to be ready to hear from you, and Father, to be uh, changed by the word of God. Help me to get out of the way, Father. Help me to decrease and you to increase. 
Lord, thank you for your love and, and your mercy towards us. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, a heart check study. The, the word desire is used 185 times in the scripture in 182 verses. And the way that I've studied this is this is a, just a picture of my screen as I'm studying. I don't know how I've got about 20, 30 pages like this. Every time the word desire is used in the scripture, I've taken and, and put into a, my, my word program and headed it off with what is this talking about in this time? Is it a desire to get something from God, a desire to uh, have your will accomplished? How is it used in this passage? And then I write notes on each one of w the way that it's being used. So that's how I study this. I haven't cracked a commentary this week at all. I've not looked up uh, the... I've looked at the Greek words, but that didn't really help me because they weren't, it was varied, and, and it, it's perfect in English, and, and I looked at some, you know, uh, dictionaries and all that, but very little. Basically, what I've done is I've opened my Bible and read it all week, all the times that the word desire is used, and it explodes off the page. It's just exciting. So here, I'm going to give you my synopsis of the word desire before we move into the passages. So the criteria of desire is to recognize that you have a want, something that's lacking, and then to recognize that the want is not yet met. So I want that thing, and I haven't yet got it. Now, this is interesting to me because it's in, in this way, God cannot desire. You, you understand? Because he is all-powerful. So the act of wanting something is also the act of receiving that thing because there's nothing outside of his power. And yet the scripture clearly shows us God wants. He desires a thing for us. The thing is that when we see God's desire, God's desire is for us to or to bring us to a place. In other words, the almighty God, the eternal God, has given us free will and that will, at times, is in opposition to God's own will. And his desire is for us to come back into his fold so that he can protect and love and instruct us. I love God. Your will, this is an important distinction, your will is the engine of your actions. Now, what I mean by that is that, that when, you, when you decide that you want something, you, uh, let's say uh, you want to buy a new truck. Right? So if you're going to buy a new truck, you need to have some money or some credit to go buy a new truck. So how do you do that? You say, that's what I want, and then you decide and move toward that goal, whatever that goal is you set for yourself. So the engine or the motivator of your action, the thing that makes your action actually work out, is your will. For instance, the guy that lives in the basement, right, the, the quintessential 48-year-old man that lives in the basement with his mom upstairs eating Cheetos, right? He lives there, and he goes, I want to be rich, and he eats another Cheeto. I'm not picking on Cheetos. Okay, so he eats some more Cheetos. So he doesn't have the will to accomplish the desire. You see that? The will is the engine of the desire. The other guy's going to college, says, I want to be rich. So he goes to MIT, he studies, he, he produces, he works, he invests himself because he has the will to accomplish the thing. So the will is the engine of your actions. The desire is the site with which you aim your will. This is the most important thing that I can tell you about the word desire is that it is the thing, the, the scope that will direct your will. Now, why is that important? So um, I periodically see uh, young men with, with hair down to their waist, and it's curly and combed out, and, and it's real pretty, you know. And um, I don't want my boys to have pretty hair, right? They're boys. I don't want them to have pretty hair. So, so I could go to my boys, and I could say, don't, don't cut your hair that way. That's, that's not, I don't want you to have pretty hair. That's, and I could impose my will on them until they get grown, and then they can have pretty hair if they want to have pretty hair. But instead, what I do is I raise my sons so that they don't want pretty hair. That's not their desire. They don't want long gold, golden locks that are rolling down their back. They don't want, you know, tattoos or things in their tongues. Or they, don't, they don't want those things because I've curbed their desire or instructed their desire as they've grown up. So you understand that we come to sin 
And we can say we're going to overcome sin with our willpower, but if before we get there we can align our desire with God, then there's no struggle. There's no difficulty. I, I don't have any desire for drugs, right? I don't walk past. I saw some guys smoking crack or whatever in a little glass bowl last week. I'm driving by. I never, I never thought, mm, man, I wish I could pull over and jump out and take a hit of that. You know, I'm driving by, I'm thinking, those poor suckers. And I told my boys, we're, we're going biking. I'm like, those guys, man, we saw them sleeping this morning, and there they are, and their lives are falling apart. They live in a car, and they're filth. And, and we drove by, and we're like, man, those poor guys. We don't desire that because we haven't built a desire for that. We don't, we don't want that thing. So if we can align our desire with God, church, get a hold of this. If we can align our desire with God, then everything else falls into place. It says, what does it tell us? Set your affections on things above and not on the things. You know, the Bible knew this all along. I had so much fun studying it, though. Okay, regardless of the target, the morality is not, not necessarily the consequences, but the morality of the action is determined by the desire that did the aiming. Now, now this is another important facet of desire. The morality of your actions are determined by your desire, not by the actions themselves. You say, well, that sounds weird. Now, that doesn't mean the consequence. Sometimes there's consequences for action, but the morality of it. Here's a a for instance. Let's suppose that you hate your neighbor, right? Just the guy's a jerk. He does terrible things to you all the time. He throws stuff in your yard and whatever. So you hate your neighbor. And so, but don't do that. That's wrong. Okay. But you hate your neighbor. And so you go out there and you take your 13 millimeter wrench and you get under his car and you pull his brake line almost loose, you know, and you're going to kill your neighbor because you, you hate the guy and you want to kill him. So you pull that brake line almost loose. You live at the top of the mountain. And so your neighbor goes out and the brakes work the first four times till he gets on that slope and then he hits his brakes, nothing. So he goes sailing down the mountain, right? And he's creeping around cars, that's squealing, and he's all, he almost hits somebody. There's a guy walking across the road. He jerks the wheel over and, and goes flying off this bluff just to not hit this guy. Bounces three or four times, hit this great big fir tree, and it just bends over and gently sets him in the bottom of the valley. And here comes the guy on the, that he almost hit. He comes screaming at him, hey, you nearly killed me. He goes, my brakes were out. He goes, your brakes were out, and you dodged me? Just, just so that you were going to die. And he goes, yeah, but I couldn't hit you. And he goes, you know what? I happen to own um, uh, this electric car company. I'm going to give you a brand new electric pickup truck, okay? Because you rescued, you saved my life. Brand new electric pickup with a brand new electric motorcycle and like four-wheeler and a and million dollars. So then here comes your neighbor back in his new electric pickup truck with his trailer, with his four-wheeler and his motorcycle in the back. And he pulls back up to his garage and you come out there and you go, wow, that's a nice truck. Where'd you get your truck? And he goes, you're not going to believe this. My brakes went out. And I was going down, I missed it. Okay, blah, 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 he tells the story. And, and you go, wow, that's great news. What a blessing that your brakes went out. And he goes, yeah, I mean, it's amazing. Look at what I, he goes, I, I did that for you. <laughs> I disconnected your brake line. You're going to give me the motorcycle or the four-wheeler? You see, the actions are not by what you're judged by. It's the, des- the desire of your actions. You follow the difference. You wanted to kill your neighbor. Your neighbor's going to go, ha, that's hilarious. Yeah, here's your four-wheeler. He's going to say, I'm calling the law. And you go, but look, it's been a blessing to you. It doesn't matter. Okay, listen, your desire, your desire is the morality of your actions, what you want. And this is important, okay? Desire is the moral integer of our lives, when the underlying motivation is wrong, the action is wrong. Okay, you understand an integer in math, a negative times a positive is a negative. Why? I don't know. We have some school teachers, ask them. But uh, a negative, t- I, I do know, but anyway, a negative times a positive is a negative. It's always a negative. And you go, well, why is a negative times a positive? Because when you start with a, a something that's in in the negative side and you multiply it, it just becomes more negative. Desire is the integer of our moral lives. When you start with an evil desire, it does not matter the action. The desire is what is the consequence. Now, why is that important? Remember the guys came to Christ and he's, this is, uh, and and he's talking about the second coming. He says, in that day, there's going to be people that come to me and say, Lord, Lord, I've cast out devils. I've done all this great stuff. 
that doesn't count. Why not? Because the reason, the motivation behind it was not faith and love in God. That's the difference. Because your desire was not for me. Your desire was for your religion. And we'll, I can't remember if I get to deal with that or not. I, I have so many notes that I deleted. I can't remember what's still in here. Okay, so the desire, what you desire is the why behind your action. Romans 14, 22 says this, Hast thou faith? Now, Paul here is talking about, um, he's talking about eating meat offered to idols and uh, things like uh, uh, drinking wine. So he's talking about this, this something that is not morally wrong necessarily, the, the eating the meat offered to idols, but it would cause some people to stumble. And Paul's giving a doctrine, an explanation of that. He says, hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So Paul says, if when you come to a decision, am I going to eat this meat or not, and your, your heart is in a place that you feel like it's wrong, then the action is wrong. The action is not at issue. The issue is the motivation behind the action. You see the difference. Hebrews 4.12, this is how you know. It says, For the word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and as a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So he says the scripture will come along and it will discern not just your actions, but the why behind your actions, the thought and intent of the heart. Look at, look at what the scribes do and try to divorce in your mind the action from the desire. Okay, Luke 20, verse uh, 46. Beware the scribes which desire to walk in long robes and love greetings in the markets and the highest seats in the synagogues and the chief rooms at feast, which devour widows' houses and for a show make long prayer, the same shall receive greater damnation. So we come to this and we go, okay, so what can we do? What can we not do? We can't wear long robes. No, that's not what this is about. Okay, so uh, we shouldn't greet each other. because, Or if you greet each other, do it without love. Like, like hey, you know, don't, don't love greetings. Or the highest seat, sit in a low chair. You see how if we try to follow the actions, we come, it becomes silly. It becomes an un, unreasonable, weird thing. Listen, I grew up in an Amish community. That's the way the scripture is read. That's the understanding behind it. You come to a passage and you go, how can I fulfill this? We've got to change the way we greet each other. We can't love greetings. We have to change the way where it says, uh, talking about long prayers, we'll pray in silence. We'll sit around the table and not pray. We'll just close our eyes. You know what? Same problem. Same problem that was here. See, it's the intention behind the act, not the act. It says they love the chief rooms and they make long prayers. Is there anything wrong with a long prayer? There's not. The problem is when that prayer is designed for you to be seen by. It's designed to focus toward you and what you're doing. You know, often when, when I see a, a um, and, and don't, the, well, again, it's not the action, it's the heart behind you, but as a check for me, right, as a check and balance in my life, I see a, a group chat where everybody's praying for somebody. And I, don't, I, I either won't post or post something small, and I'll pray in my closet, which I just ruined because I told you. But, but I, I do that because it's a check and a balance for me. Lord, why am I coming before your throne right now? Is it because I can post on here this prayer of what I'm praying? Or is it because I have a tender heart before you, and I want to get on my knees for what I see? I want to lift that thing up. And I'm careful for my own heart, my own mind, to keep that steered correctly. Walk in long robes. Listen, if you desire an office in the church, the Bible says you desire a good thing. If you desire to serve in that way. If you desire to wear a long robe and everybody to see you, that you're a deacon or an elder or whatever, then it doesn't matter what actions come along behind that. It doesn't matter how much good you do in that position. Everything you do is sin in that position. If your desire, let, get a hold of this, if your desire in the church is to be seen and, and to have everybody go, wow, what a great guy you are. Look, how, look how, how special you are in the way that you pray for everybody so long and fasting. Look at what you're doing. If you're doing that, it doesn't matter how long you pray. Your prayer is a sin and a stench in the nostril of God. 
Because you're coming to Him not because you love Him, but because you love the adulation that you receive. Desire is the morality, not the action. Friends, that's heavy. That is a heart check right there. That is a time to, to listen. Listen, if, you're, if the reason that you're in ministry is you get paid for it, here's how you'll know. If you stop getting paid for it and you stop doing the ministry, you're a hireling, not a minister. And if you're a hireling, then everything you do is a hireling. You've been paid for and you get no glory from God. You get It's a stench in the nostril of God. You're not working for God. You're working for man, man, mammon. You're working for money. And God doesn't appreciate that. The desire for God or for money is a clear-cut line. And if, if you say, now if you say, well, I need to feed my home, my family. I, I'm in a straight, I need to do this. It's not wrong to have money for ministry. It's a matter of is there a purpose to get rich, to make money, or is it a purpose to serve God? And if you can't serve him in a capacity full-time, half-time, whenever, if you won't serve him without getting paid for it, then your service is a stench. Psalm 78, 27. It says, He rained flesh also upon them as dust, and, the fe- and feathered fowls like the sand of the sea. And he let it fall in the midst of their camp round about their habitations. So they did eat and were filled, for he gave them their own desire. They were not estranged from their lust, but while their meat was yet in their mouths. Now before I go further, This is talking about the children of Israel in the wilderness. They were getting manna. They said the manna is not good enough. Give us uh, birds to eat, Uh, pigeons, or uh, yeah, pigeons, quail. Give us quail to eat. And he said, if if God, if you were just going to bring us out here and feed us cornbread, we'd have rather stayed in bondage in, in Egypt because at least we got leeks and we got meat and we got things to eat that we liked. And God said, the point to being out here is not the food that you get. The point to being out here is you get to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You get to lay down those false gods that fell on their face before me in Egypt, and you get to come out and praise the everlasting God. And you want meat? That's what your deal is? And he said that it's a stench. Psalm 78, 31. The wrath of God came upon them and slew the fattest of them and smote down the chosen men of Israel. For all this they sinned and believed not for his wondrous works. Therefore their days did he consume in vanity and their years in trouble. David said, because they didn't believe you. See, it wasn't about the food. It was about the fact that they desired that rather than desiring God. Rather than desire to be in the presence of God, they desired to have some food to eat. And it says that they did not believe his wondrous works, what he'd done in Egypt. 7834 When he slew them, then they sought him, and they returned and inquired early after God. And they remembered that God was their rock, and the high God their redeemer. Nevertheless, they did flatter him with their mouths, and they lied unto him with their tongues. For their heart was not right with him, neither were they steadfast in his covenant. So God came along, and he judged Israel, and Israel said, Okay, we give. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. We'll we'll destroy the calf. We'll we'll throw that thing away. We won't do it because you sent snakes. It was bad. We were dying, so we're sorry. And God says, I see your heart. You're not sorry. It's not in your heart. You're not loving me. You're hating the, the consequence of your sin. You don't love me. The desire was the difference. And he said, your actions don't please me. You're offering me sacrifice, and that's not good. That's not what I want. I want you to desire me. I want you to have faith in me. Those, those two are, you can't separate them. Proverbs 23, 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Eat and drink, saith he to thee, but his heart is not with thee. Solomon, uh, Solomon says that you'll come to a guy, and this guy says, Oh, buddy, come in, have some meals with me. We're going to eat and drink together. And Solomon said, Don't be fooled. This guy's heart's not with you. He is acting as though he likes you or he loves you or he's, he's ministering to you, but that's not what's in his heart. He's doing this to gain favors or for some reason beyond the fact that he wants to be around you and bless you. God is looking at the heart. The Bible tells us this over and over. that We see the outside, but God sees the heart, that he's judging the intent behind the actions. He says what? If you look on a woman in lust, you've committed adultery with her already. Now, I haven't done anything. Let's say I'm driving along and and I go, yeah, boy, I'd, I'd like to with her. That you just committed adultery. No, I didn't. I'm, I haven't done anything. 
Yes, you have your desire. Now, your actions didn't follow your desire because you'd get caught. Because your wife would know. Because other people would find out. Because she'd slap you because you're ugly and she's young. Because for all these reasons, you didn't, you didn't follow up on your desire. But you know what? You wanted to. And so you're guilty of that crime. Because your desire was what, what carried the sentence of morality, not your action. What you desire and what rules you are the same thing. Now, I'm, I'm, honestly, I'm struggling because each one of these I could preach for two hours, like on each topic here. It's so much just meat. It's like we're going by the salad bar, we're jogging, and I'm throwing some stuff on your plate, right? There's so much that we're missing. Get in the Word of God and, and study it like it's awesome. Song of Solomon 10, 7, or 7, verse 10. This is uh, the Queen of Sheba talking. She said, I am my beloved's, and his desire is toward me. Now, what you desire and what rules you are the same things. What directs your actions and what desires you are the same things. Remember, we talked about will is the engine behind your actions. Desire is is what aims your will. It's what aims what you're going to go toward because you want that thing. Your affections are are geared toward that thing, so you desire it and that you're going to go after it. So when she says, I'm my beloved's and his desire is toward me, his what he wants and aims toward is also what will drive him, his direction that he's going. Look what it says in Kings 10, uh, 13, 1 Kings 10, 13. And King Solomon gave unto the queen of Sheba all her desire. Whatsoever she asked, besides that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty, so she returned and went to her own country, she and her servants. So when Sheba was there, she said, listen, Solomon's desire is toward me. The fulfillment of that was Solomon saying, honey, pick it out. It's yours. My kingdom, your kingdom, same thing. Pick it out. Whatever you want. Put it in that boat and take it with you. And so what you desire and what rules you are the same thing. Friends, this should be a wake-up call. Do you desire Jesus? Do you desire his word in your life? Do you desire his work in you? Or do you desire money? Or do you desire physical uh, fulfillment, food, drugs, sex, whatever? Is that what drives you for tomorrow Or is the fact that you get to wake up and serve God what drives you for tomorrow? Listen, the more we desire God, the closer to Him we walk. And the more we desire God, the more God gives us all the desires of our hearts. Because our desires line up with Him. And you know what? It's blessing and wonderful. And and it's fulfilling because God made us. He designed us. He literally wrote the book on us. And if we read the book and agree with the book and follow the book, then we function the way we were designed to function, and God is glorified in our lives and shares that glory with us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He wants us to have glory, and that glory is found in desiring God with your whole heart. Man, that's exciting. Okay, I'm excited. Romans 6.17, me and John, we're excited. The rest of you guys just keep sleeping. We're all excited. Okay. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. Paul says, listen, there was a time that you were a servant sold under sin, and sin was your desire. Sin was everything to you, your focus, your mind, your heart. Your affections, everything is in a line with sin. And you go, well, not every action was sin. Listen, the action's not the issue. The underlying motivation behind the action is at issue. There's nothing wrong with being rich. Filthy, stinking rich. Nothing wrong with it. Desiring that above God. And you have an idol. And you have a problem. And you need to let it go. He says that you were servants and you now are obeying from the heart. Not that I'm forcing my members to not do bad things. You know what that does? Bubkiss. Nothing. Doesn't change a stinking thing because it's not the action, it's the desire behind it. But God can change your heart. He can change your heart. Get in a room with God and stay there until that's where you want to be. 
You know how you do it? Open the book. You open the book. Haggai 2.7. It's talking about the millennial reign when all of the nations come to Israel to receive uh, the healing of the nations, the reign, everything. They have to come to Israel to get that. And, and, and God is talking about that time. And he says, and I will shake all nations. And the desire of all nations shall come. And I will fill this house with glory, saith the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, saith the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in, and in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. He says, listen, there's coming a time when every nation on earth will bow down before my nation. And if, and if you want rain next year, you've got to come here and talk to me before you get it. And if you, want, if you want silver and gold, you've got to come here and you've got to talk to me before you get it. Because everything is coming through my city and my city only. It's the gateway to everything else that you want. And your desire, it says, the desire of the nation shall come. That's the way he's using that term. And it's important because we're going to move to Genesis 3.16 next. And, and this, is, this is incredible the way this ties together. 3.16, unto the woman. So Adam and Eve have just sinned. God's called them to task. They've come before him. He's just cursed the serpent for what his role was. And then he's going to curse the woman or, or tell the woman what happened. So he turns to the woman. He says, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrows and thy conception. In sorrow shalt thou bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. So God says to the woman, because of what you've done, because of the fact that you uh, ate that fruit when I told you not to, your desire will be toward your husband. Now, it's incredibly important that the word to is used and not for. This is one of the places that all the other translations screw this up bad. And, and I'll show you the filigree of how it connects. Your desire will be to your husband. And this was, we think, we get to this passage and we think, that doesn't seem fair, right? That doesn't seem equitable. Eve sinned, what was that, five, six, seven thousand years ago? And so why does a wife still have to submit to her husband or her desire toward her husband today if it wasn't? And before the women's livers throw rotten fruit at me, we're, we're, we're going somewhere with this. So why is it? Well, if you're, if you're a coach and you're teaching something to your team, right, and you have your teams coming out and you have the home team and and, and so you have the blue shirts, the white shirts, while your team is, is preparing, and they all come out. And the team captain of the blue shirts that's coming out, there's all one team, we're all practicing together, comes out. And she's a, a minute late. And the coach says, whoa, 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 you're late. She goes, well, I was doing, no. Run laps, the whole blue team, run laps, run laps. The rest of the team says, it's not fair. We weren't late, we were already here. Coach says, I don't care, run laps. Why? Because he's teaching you something. He's teaching you teamwork. He's teaching you how to breathe while you're running. He's teaching the whole team obedience when he does this. And you say, but it's not fair. No, it isn't. Right? It's not fair. It's not trying to be fair. It's not unjust, but it's not fair. You see, the coach doesn't really care about practice. He doesn't care when it starts, and he's going to get paid either way, and he wants the team to win. So to, in order to get the team to win, he's teaching the team something. He's teaching them teamwork. He's teaching them how, how to work together, how to, uh, to exercise. And you know what? He's going to make the white shirts run twice as hard as the blue shirts. He just hasn't done it yet, but he's going to. So when he says that your desire will be to your husband, what's he saying? So here comes the wife. Man, she's just kind of Wonder Woman over there. She's got it all together, and, and she's, she's uh, uh, you know, not married yet, and she has some desire. And these aren't bad desires. She wants to have a good income, uh, money. She wants a place to live, a fulfilling career, a family name. This is, some, you know, something that's some posterity of her, of her lineage, of her line. She wants those things. But she sins, and so here comes her husband. He's kind of a nerd. Kind of a little bit slouchy there. He's got a little bit of a pouch. And you go, well, he doesn't need to be in charge of her. Obviously, like, she's Wonder Woman, and, and he's like the, the cleric that, that keeps up with the money for the uh, suit of shoes that she's got in her. Like, like, there's no question about who should be in charge here, except that God comes along, and God says, I'm going to crown the husband with the authority of the family, and all of her desire will be to her husband. 
All of the things that she wants comes through her husband, her family name, her career, her place to live, her money, all of this. This is primarily a physical curse at this time that God places on the women. He makes, he makes Eve, the Bible tells us in Peter, a weaker vessel. So that now, today we can talk about equality because we have gasoline engines and electricity and stuff like that. But in the past, there was a big difference in health and strength and ability between the men and women. That was a curse from God that God said your desire is going to be to your husband. Now, don't glare daggers at me. Stop that. I didn't write this. I'm not a sociologist. I'm not trying to put together a perfect society. That's not my business. I teach the Bible. Here's what's in the Bible. Okay, I'm a Bible teacher. And, and I'm not making apology or, or judging the morality of the Bible. I assume that the Bible's moral when I get there. I assume that when I open it up, what it says is true and right because I have faith. And my faith supersedes my faith in society and sociology. So don't glare at me. Okay, please. Genesis 4, 7 says, If thou dost well, now this is God talking to Cain. This is after Cain had offered the wrong sacrifice, but before he killed his brother. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. He says to Cain, you're the older brother, and if you do well, then you're the one that will control the inheritance of the family. You will have the family name, and Abel won't, because you are the older brother. Don't you know that all you have to do is repent before me for that to come into place? Do you see the word desire and how it's used? Keep going. Acts 20.20. 20. And how I kept back nothing, this is Paul talking, how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith towards our Lord, toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now look again at this word that he's using, toward. He says, Paul says, what I've come, what I've taught you is repentance toward God. That means I've turned away from all of my desires, money, career, job, life, whatever. I've turned that, I've turned away from me, my righteousness. I've turned away from that, and I've turned toward God and all my desires toward the Lord. All my desires toward the head that is Christ. And, and in faith, which is very synonymous with desire. Look at what Ephesians 5.22 says. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. This is an update of what was in Genesis 3. As unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. 24, this is important. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let wives be their own husbands. You know, it's not fair, but it's beautiful. And here's why. When I was in Honduras, I was a, a dive master, and uh, I, I was helping an instructor. We are teaching a group of guys to dive, and and we had this group come from California, and there was, it was a, a college break. There were four girls and one dude, and this guy was the cock of the walk. I mean, he was like, he had these four girls on vacation with him, and he was like all that. He, he had a beard, but not like when I get a beard, like I forgot to shave beard. It was all like cut in and shaped, you know, and he was styled, and he was like worked out a lot. He was the guy. I mean, come on, he got four girls to go on vacation with him. And so he, he shows up in Honduras, and we're going to teach these five people to dive. And so um, he's got the swagger and the look and all that, you know. And so we get the equipment out, and, and he puts his together, and then he's showing the girls how to do that, you know. And he's kind of back and forth, and, and the instructor and I are just kind of chuckling because we see these knuckleheads come through every day. And, and so uh, we, we get all our gear together, and we put our gear on, and, and we do our, our first checks and uh, he's like, my regulator's not working. I can't get enough air. And uh, so we check his, no, your reg's fine. So we go and we, we get our face in the water, just about, you know, just like the water level's here. This is our first time, right? So we're, we're dipping down. The water level goes like this. Man, he jumps up. He starts throwing equipment off. Bubbles are coming everywhere. And he goes, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And we're like, you were in the water for two seconds. Like, that's how long you go between breaths if you're, like, just resting on the couch. What do you mean you can't breathe? Well, he's panicking because he has stuff on his face. And, and so we're like, look, look, you're fine. He's like, no, I can't get enough air. 
And I'll, well, I'll check. No, you still have 3,000 pounds of air. I think you're okay. And so he's like, it's not working. My gear's not working. And so the instructor and I, you know, we make eye contact, and he nods, and I nod, and okay. So he takes the four girls, and I take the guy. We take all the gear off, and I say, okay, set it all down. He's like, but it's not working. No, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Set it all down. So, okay, get her mask. Take the snorkel off. Get your mask. Don't put the strap on. Get your mask. Okay, we got the mask. Put it on your face. Duck your head into water. Okay, stand up. So, did you see those fish? What fish? No, look. Come here. Come here. So, we go back down. See these fish? These little, little goat fish. See the thing on the bottom? Those goat fish are finding stuff by the electrical uh, that's in the... And so, we it went that way for two hours. And so, after a while, we can't see the goat fish. Grab the snorkel. We can stay down here longer. Okay, put the snorkel on. And we're, we're watching the goat fish and stuff. And, and I'm like, okay, I tell you what. Let's, let's grab our, our gear, but we're just going to inflate the BC, set it here, put the reg in. We're going to keep looking at goat fish. What's it doing now? And so after a while, let's put our gear back on. After about two hours, he and I are at 12 feet, and he's breathing fine, and he's learned because we had some object lessons. You see, he learned to trust. He learned to have faith that his gear is going to work. He's going to be able to breathe even though he's underwater. He's got all this stuff in his face and bubbles coming up, all this stuff going on, but you can trust it's okay. You see, God knew that when Christ came, it was going to require us to trust to trust that he has our eternal souls taken care of, that we can let go, that we can say, Lord, all our desire is to you, and I'm, I'm just I'm going to let go, and, and you're going to take care of me, and I'm just going to rest in that. I'm not going to do anything, and everything that I want, everything that I need, all of my hope is coming from you, Lord, and I haven't got anything to add to it. You see, we needed an object lesson. We, God starting with babies that haven't got any experience at all. And he wants us to experience something so that we can trust him. And you know what? This is practice. We are but a vapor that's going to blow away in the wind. And then eternity starts. To live is Christ, but to die is gain. Because that's when the good stuff starts. That's when the glorified body's here. So God says, listen, I want to start with this marriage covenant with a man and a woman. And I'm going to make you different. You're going, to have, you're going to have to trust each other because you're going to be different. You're going to think different. Why would God do that? Why would he make her think that way and me think this way and be from Mars and Venus and some such nonsense? Because he's teaching us trust. He's teaching us obedience in our relationship. He's teaching us what it means to shepherd and to guard and to protect somebody that's weaker. He's teaching us what it means to fulfill someone else because he's going to do that for us. Because he wants us to repent toward him and all of our desire to be to him. And when we get to the New Testament, he explains it. For 5,000 years, you, you didn't know why. Why did you do this? This seems kind of obnoxious because when he gets to the New Testament, he goes, See, you're my bride and you're weak. And you have, you have physical ailments and, 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 and you can't fulfill yourself, but I can do that for you. And I love you and cherish you and protect you and guard you. And I will minister to you and lay my life down for you. That's what a husband ought to do. Wives, we're bad at it. Okay? We're, we're lousy at, at, at being the way God wants us to be. That's why we're practicing. And wives, honestly, you're bad at it too. You're, you're bad at submitting to the husbands the way that we're supposed to submit to God. And you know what? That's why you're practicing. Because we get to say, God, you're right and not me, and I want to follow you. And listen, for instance, the husband's job is a lot worse than the wife's. It's a lot heavier, a lot more responsibility, a lot more arduous and difficult if you do it right before God. Here's the way it looks now. My desire, our desire, husbands, wives, their desire, our, all that we want is to Christ. You know what I gave up? Everything. You know what I kept? Nothing. My money? My family name, Woo! son of God, my family name, child of God, brother of Jesus Christ. That's wrapped up in the Lord. I let go of my lineage. I'm Nathan Pearl for now, so you can identify me. But friends, that's just, that's just a misnomer for now. That's my nickname because my real name is Jesus. I mean, is Nathan, son of God, brother of Jesus Christ. Oh, and he gave me a fulfilling career. Friends, he said, I want you to go and take this message to the whole world. What could be greater than to grab your neighbor and say, God loves you. God has sent a deliverer to reconcile you to himself. 
Woo! My career comes through God and my place to live. See, I'm not satisfied with this home. This is a transcendental place. I'm looking for a city whose builder and maker is God that has 12 gemstones for a foundation and pearls for doors. I'm looking for a place with streets of gold with a rainbow inside of it and millions of people worshiping God. That's what I, my family, my home, my place to live, my money, I gave it all up. I gave it all to the Lord. It's not my money, it's his money. Where do you want to spend it tomorrow, God? It's your money. Now he said invest it. He said invest your talents, but it's his money. You know what? God just made this beautiful picture from Genesis all the way up into the New Testament so I could understand the love of God. And it excites me. I'm just over the moon in love with God for this. And you know, he started it with this passage, your desire will be to your husband. And it ties it all together. Whew, I, I just, I love the Bible. I love studying it every week. Luke 18, 22. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, Yet lackest thou one thing, sell all that thou hast, and distribute unto the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. Come and follow me. And he heard this and was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. Here's a man that comes to God and Christ, and, and he says, I want to follow you. What should I do? And, and Jesus says, keep the commandments. And he goes, I've done that since I was a kid. I'm, check, 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 all the actions. The actions are right. I've done the actions. And Jesus says, okay, then give up your money. Oh, my money. How am I going to survive? I'll take care of that. Let your desire be toward me. But, but, but I have so much of it. Yeah. But you can have me instead. You can choose me and you can let the money go. But the money's so it's so it's such a weight around your neck, brother. Let it go. Let go of that stuff and give it to God. And you know what? He'll give you the desire of your heart unless the desire of your heart is fornication. It's adultery. It's covetousness. God won't give you those desires. So if that's your heart's desire, repent. Repent towards God. That's what it's about. And align your desire with Him. And when it's aligned with Him, your desires in, in Him are fulfilled. And it's so, it's so good. Oh, I can't keep going. God, uh, uh, I can't. I got to, uh, uh, guys. Oh, I'm so good. The notes are, you say, see that? Wasn't that good? Um, what the wicked desire. We'll go through this real quick. What the wicked desire. I have five minutes. The vehicle in which every evil desire is housed is the desire to be like God, equal in authority, if not power. The desire for food, sex, money, power, status, and uh, etc. are the symptoms of the burning need to be independently sufficient and all-powerful in your own kingdom. So desire for things is a symptom of your desire to be independent from God, not dependent on God. And you say, well, how could my desire for women be a desire to be independent from God? Your desire is not just for women. Your desire is to be fulfilled in the flesh. Your desire is to give your flesh everything that your flesh wants because the state in which God exists is a state of completeness in which he has no desire, carnal or otherwise. Anything that he wants, he has. And we want that state, and we seek that state. We seek being there. And so we want to be fulfilled in whatever way that we can, whatever way that is. And the proof to that is we don't all desire the same thing. We desire to be fulfilled the way that we want to be fulfilled so that what we have is a lack of need, a lack of want in our lives. Psalms 140 verse 8 says, Grant not, O Lord, the desire of the wicked, further not his wicked device, lest they exalt themselves. Selah. David said, listen, don't let the wicked have what they want, which is money, it's, it's power, it's all of these things, food, whatever. Don't let the wicked have it. They'll use it to exalt themselves. That is the point of, of the desires that we have. John 30, 3 verse 30 John is the uh, John the Baptist is the opposite. He says, "He must increase, but I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth, 
He that cometh from heaven is above all. John says, listen, I have this recognition. You're God and I'm not. John said, I recognize something. You need to increase in my life and I need to decrease. We need less of Nathan and more of Jesus. We need more of him because he is what I want. He is my desire. All of it. And that's what I want. That's what John the Baptist said. John, or David said, the wicked are not so. He said, if the wicked get what they want, they're exalted, not you. You see the difference? Habakkuk 2.5. It says, yea, also because he transgresses by wine. He's talking about the... Uh, He's talking about the Antichrist. Because he transgresses by wine, he is a proud man. Neither keep, keepeth at home, who enlargeth his desire as hell, and is death, and cannot be satisfied, but gathereth unto himself all nations, and heapeth unto him all people. He is a, the problem that he has is not uh, that, that he has a desire for this or that. It's a desire to exalt himself, to be enlarged, to have everything that he wants, to be fulfilled and not need God, to look at God and say, thank you, but no thank you. I'm fine. I don't need anything you've got because I'm sufficient in and of myself. I have everything that I could possibly want, and I don't need you. You know what the Lord said about the church? He said in the church at Laodicea, that's us, folks. He said to the church at Laodicea, you say you're rich, increased with goods, and need of nothing. But I counsel you to buy of me gold tried in the fire, and I salve that you might see, because you don't recognize the fact that you're poor, wretched, miserable, and blind, and naked. That you are in complete lack. You know why? Because your desire is wrong. You're desiring for earthly clothing, earthly food, earthly fulfillment, and he says, your desire is messed up. It should be for me. And you don't even realize how destitute you are. When God looks down and he sees us in our little lifespan, and we're going, I ain't submitting him. You, you, you met this guy. He's terrible. I ain't submitting him. God says, look, that's not the issue. Submit to me. Be obedient to me because your life's short, and I've got eternity for you. I want to put you in charge of so many things. I want you to be have this glorious future that I've got for you. But to do that, you have to display faith in me. You have to believe me when society is telling you don't. When society says, live with your girlfriend first so that you can decide if you want to actually get married or not. You say, no, because I believe God and not man. Because I will submit to him and not to what society tells me to do. When it says that you need to be gender fluid, you say, that's garbage. God made man and woman, and that's what I'll be. What God made me because he's God and I'm not. I don't choose, he does. And we recognize that, and our desire is for God. The, the beast is not so. When the Antichrist comes, he is anti-everything that's God, and he is a proud man. He doesn't keep his own home, but he enlarges his desire. Matthew 16.1. I'll finish with this. I won't finish. I'll stop with this. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came and tempted, desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. And he answered and said unto them, When it is evening, even, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. Oh, ye hypocrites. Ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. And there shall no sign be given unto it but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. He said, listen, you're looking for a sign from me so that you can have clarity as to who I am. You don't want to have faith. You want to have sight. He says, you want to go and tell others, look, I saw Jesus, so I saw him do this thing, so uh, I'm giving you my stamp of approval. And he says, I'm not interested in your stamp of approval. You're a wicked and adulterous generation. You come to me in repentance and say, Lord, I need you. I need you in my life. I need you to adjust me, to teach me, to instruct me. I need you to be the Lord of my life, and I'm letting it go. I'm giving it to you. I'm, I'm giving it all to you. I'm repenting of my good works. Of all the things that I can do for you, all the times I can go to church, all the prayers I can give, the long robes I can wear, all the preaching I can do, all the singing, everything I can do, God, I give it up. I've got nothing to bring to you. I come to you as just a broken son, saying, Lord, I need you. I need you. I'm a needy creature, and I need you. That's where God wants us. You know why? Then he can fill us up. Then he can pour into us. Because we stopped trying to 
fill ourselves up with stagnant, stinky toilet water, and we're going to let him pour the living water into us, and we get to chase him. Friends, adjust your desire. Adjust your desire, and here's how you adjust it. Not by going, I'm going to change my desire. You take up the word of God, and you open that thing up, and you behold your face in a mirror. And that word of God's quick, and it's powerful. And it's sharper than any two-edged sword. A two-edged sword's not going to divide the soul and spirit. It's not going to tell you what your heart's thinking, but the Word of God will. And you read that thing and you go, whoa, that was in my heart. Oh, I'll put that from me. Because, Lord, I want this in my heart. This is what I want today. And you're seeking, friends, I got to do that this week. Oh, I got to do that. I got to get on my knees before God and say, God, I don't want that in my heart. I want this in my heart. And him fill that up. Mm. Okay, I'm going to quit preaching. I don't want to, but I'm going to quit. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and your goodness. And whew, thank you for the word of God. Thank you for what it does in our lives and for how it changes me, Father. Lord, I, I give it all to you. My money, my time, my career, my hope for the future, my housing, my vehicles. Father, my money my relationships, my family. Father, I place that all before the throne, and I just say, Lord, it's yours. Right here, right now, Father, I turn my heart completely again to you, and I want to walk in repentance towards you. Lord, my time is yours. Use it how you want. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly and take us home. Father, don't let us wander forever in the wilderness, Father, but take us home. Let us see that city, your city, that you've built with your hands. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this time. Thank you for us getting a chance to be together. Thank you for the word of God. In Jesus' precious name, amen.